Hi guys, welcome to my brand new YouTube channel called Ace Academics. My name is Jemima Mills and today I will be doing a video on an overview of Synoptic Chat. So let's go. The first things we need to know is our objectives. And we have seven objectives. And the first one is what are Synoptic Chats? The second one is what symbols I use to interpret Synoptic Chats? Third, what are isobars? Fourth, Define low and high pressure. Fifth, instruments used to measure weather. Six, identify weather systems on synoptic charts. And last, but certainly not least, why are synoptic charts important? To begin with, we must first ask, or ask ourselves, what are synoptic charts? And I gave a clear, I think a very clear definition of what synoptic charts are. And a synoptic chart is any map that summarizes atmospheric conditions, that is temperature, precipitation, wind speed and direction, atmospheric pressure and cloud coverage over a wide area at a given time. So if this definition suits your fancy, what you should do is take a screenshot of this or take a note of this in your notebook. So let's go on to the second objective, and that is the symbols used to interpret synoptic charts. So I have put together or I have downloaded a chart with all the symbols that are normally on a synoptic chart. And we'll first start with the precipitation symbols. So once you see a comma, you know that is drizzle. So pinpoint that. The second one is an upside down triangle and that symbolizes a shower. The third one is a full stop. You won't see it, it's kind of behind of this but it's a full stop and that signifies rain. The next one is a star and that would signify a snow. This one is a normal triangle. Well, for shower, we had an upside down triangle. For hail, it's a normal triangle. For thunderstorm, it's a 90 degrees angle and an arrow. This one is easy to remember because the arrow looks like lightning. So that's, that is for thunderstorm. And the rest of precipitation, it's on the other side. It overlaps on the other side. So let me just show you. The rest, heavy rain is three dots. So while rain was only one dot, heavy rain would be three dots. Sleet would be rain and snow because sleet is snow that has begun melting, basically. That's what sleet is. Then the next one we have is snow shower. And this one is very literal because it's a symbol for snow and a symbol for shower. So it's the star and the upside down triangle. Then we have mist, which is two lines, and then fog, which is three lines. So let's move on to octus. And the octus one is kind of very fun for me because how I like to imagine it or how I like to understand it is that octus is like drawing eight boxes in the sky so it's like you look up to the sky and you draw eight boxes in the sky now if none of these eight boxes are filled with clouds that means that the sky is really clear that's clear sky if one of the eight boxes are filled with clouds that means that the sky is partially clear if two of the eight boxes is filled with clouds that is two over eight octaves so the cloud cover is two Octaves. If three of these eight boxes are filled with clouds, that is three octaves. So that means three eighths of the sky is covered with clouds. If four out of the eight boxes is covered with clouds, that is that means that four eighths of the sky is covered with clouds. And we can go on until we reach to eight octaves, which means that all of our eight boxes have clouds in them basically that's what it means so what we can interpret that to mean that there is overcast sky this the sky is overcast so once all your eight boxes eight boxes that you have drawn in the sky once all of them are filled with clouds that means that the sky is completely overcast so let's move on to the next side and that is the symbols for wind speed now, this one looks like the eye. And as you know, the eye of the hurricane is the calmest part. So the um, wind speed, uh, wind speed, sorry, calm is an eye. 
Now, I like to... <laughs> I like to call this a lollipop stick, but it's the proper name for it is called a legend. And this one, once it has one of the straight lines or the horizontal lines, that's one to two knots. Once it has the circle and the straight line, and it also has a staff. Now this is a half staff. So once it's a half staff, it's five knots. Once it's a full staff, it's 10 knots. If it's Two full staffs and one half staffs. We know 10. We know 10 plus 10 is 20 plus 5. That is 25. So keep that in mind. We also have the one with a triangle. And the triangle is 50 knots or more. It kind of looks like a flag. So once you see the flag, that is 50 knots or more. Let's move on to the next one. Now we have weather map symbol, sample plotted report at each station. And this is your legend. And I am basically going to go over what all of these mean. So the first thing that we have is barometric pressure. And if any time you're learning about barometric pressure, the first thing you need to know is that 1013 millibars or 1013 hectopascals is normal atmospheric pressure. That's, that's the basic thing that you need to know about barometric pressure. Now, um, yes, this is barometric pressure. So anything that goes above 10, 13 millibars is considered to be a high pressure system. And anything that falls below 10, 13 millibars is considered to be a low pressure system. And that we will be going over in the upcoming slides. So the number right underneath the barometric pressure is the change in barometric pressure in last in the last three hours so if there is a positive sign or an addition sign that means that the barometric pressure has increased if there is a negative sign that means that it has decreased and it's normally accompanied with a symbol the symbol either looks like an l or sometimes the l is on like this it looks like a seven basically the next one is the total percentage of sky covered by clouds. And that we just learned about. We just learned about octus. And as you can see here, the sky is fully covered. So that means this is eight on eight octus overcast skies. These dotted lines below stands for type of low clouds, dew point temperature, that is the amount of moisture in the atmosphere, wind speed and direction. We spoke about that. Remember this line that normally comes from the circle, it's for wind direction. So it tells where the wind is coming from. So this, we can see that the wind is coming from a southwesterly direction at 15 knots. So we have one full staff that is 10 knots and one half staff that is five knots. Type of precipitation, as you know, we have different types of precipitation. We have drizzle, we have rain, we have shower, we have hail, we have snow, we have sleet. So you will know what these letters mean. We also have temperature, which is shown on our, um, our report or sample report at each station or, or what you can call our station model. We have our temperature, which is either measured in Fahrenheit, Celsius, or Kelvin. And this one shows that it's 31 Fahrenheit. Um, this stands for type of middle clouds, and this stands for type of high clouds. So let's move on to the next one. So these are also, this is also, sorry, a chart that are some of the symbols used in interpreting synoptic charts. And the first and most important one is called an isobar. An isobar is a line joining places of equal pressure. Now, if you, you have done geography basically all your life, or if you have done geography in high school, like you have done CSEC geography, you, will, you would have learned about contour lines. And what contour lines are is the lines joining places of same height, same altitude, or same elevation. And isobars are literally, literally the same thing. They are, line, they are lines joining places of equal pressure. That is equal barometric pressure. As you can see, you see the barometric pressure in the middle of it. This one shows 1016, 1018, 1020. 
and the associated weather, the closer the isobars are, the stronger the winds. It's the same thing that we learned in contour lines, basically. The, close, the closer the contour lines, the steeper the land. The more far apart they are, the lands would be flatter. So it's the same thing for contour lines. If the, if the, con, not the contour lines, sorry, if the isobars are close together, that means that this is a low pressure system. If the isobars are far apart, that is a high pressure system. And this is the next thing on the chart here. High pressure system, remember high pressure system normally goes above 10, 13 millibars. And the description a high pressure system is an area of sinking air. Now the associated weather is generally fine weather and the winds rotate around these systems in an anti-clockwise direction. Next one, low pressure. Remember, low pressure falls below 10 protein millibars, and it is an area of rising air. Associated weather, generally cloudy weather, and a good chance of rain. Winds rotate around the systems in a clockwise direction. Next one is a tropical cyclone, and a tropical cyclone is also a low pressure system. And the description that the chat gives us is that a tropical cyclone is an area of rapidly rising air. And the associated weather would be torrential rain, very strong and destructive winds in a clockwise direction. And as you can see, the example they give us here is tropical cyclone Pamela. Let's move on. Now the rest of the chat, cold fronts. Now frontal systems are also, um, systems that you will see on a synoptic chart, like cold fronts, warm fronts, occluded fronts, and stationary fronts. A cold front is um, an area of separation of warm and cold air with the cold air behind the front. So a cold front, the cold air is behind the front. And the associated weather, there's a falling temperature and this may bring rain and storm. The fronts move in the direction of the arrowheads. Now we also have warm fronts. And the warm fronts is a separation of warm and cold air with the warm air behind the front. And the associated weather would be an increase in temperature may bring light. Sorry about that. Let's just move back may bring light showers. And it, they said there it is uncommon in Australia, but that is not really important to know as we are really focusing on the Caribbean systems per se, because remember we are focusing on the Cape Geography Unit 2 syllabus or any syllabus that you are following and you need to know what, um, how to interpret or how to understand synoptic charts. So let's move on. Now we have the type, the different types of fronts. As we said, we have warm fronts, we have cold fronts, we have stationary fronts, and we have occluded fronts. The warm front, remember the warm air is behind it. The cold front, remember the cold air is behind it. The stationary front, there is warm air and cold air. And basically they are, they are going in the same direction. Their wind direction is the same. So none of them are overpowering each other. So this is why they don't move at all. Now the occluded front, there's an area of warm air masses and an area of cold air masses. So it's an occluded front. And I will give the definition for the stationary fronts and the occluded fronts in the upcoming slides as you got the definitions for warm fronts and cold fronts in the one before. So let's move on. Now this is a stationary front. As you can see, the air is like moving against each other. So it's like none of them have the power to overpower the other one. They are going in the same direction, I would say. Now let's look at the stationary, no, this was the stationary front. This was the stationary front. And let me give the definition as promised, a stationary front forms when a cold front or warm front stops moving. This happens when two masses of air are pushing against each other, but neither is powerful enough to move the other. Winds blowing parallel to the front instead of perpendicular can help it to stay in place. A stationary front may stay put for days. 
If the wind direction changes, the front will start moving again, becoming either a cold or warm front, or the front may break apart. So whichever front becomes more powerful, this is the front that the system will become either a cold or warm front, or the front might just break apart. Because a stationary front marks the boundaries between two air masses, there are often differences in air temperatures and wind on opposite sides of it. The weather is often cloudy along a stationary front and rain or snow often falls, especially if the front is in an area of low atmospheric pressure. So this last part here is very important to know because sometimes they might ask you, what is the weather associated with this type of system? So this is very important to know this last part. Let's move on to our occluded front. So this is the diagram of our occluded front, as you can see here, the cold and dry air. This is the cold and dry air. This is the cool air. This is the occluded front. As you can see, the warm front and the cold front is joining together to form the occluded front. So let's get the definition for that. Sometimes a cold front follows right behind the warm front. A warm air mass pushes into a colder air mass, the warm front. And then another cold air mass pushes into the warm air mass, the cold front. Did I say cold front the first time? I think I wanted to say warm front. I'm not too sure about that, but you all can read and you all can understand what I'm saying. Because cold fronts move faster, the cold front is likely to overtake the warm front. This is known as an occluded front. At an occluded front, the cold air mass from the cold front meets the cool air that was ahead of the warm front. The warm air rises as these air masses come together. Occluded fronts usually form around areas of low atmospheric pressure. There is often precipitation along an occluded front from cumulonimbus, cumulonimbus, or nimbostratus cloud. This is a kind of a tongue twister for me, this word, <laughs> but it's a type of cloud. Wind changes direction as the front passes and the temperature either warms or cools. After the front passes, the sky is usually clearer and the air is drier. On a weather map shown to the left, that is the picture that we have of the occluded front, an occluded front looks like a purple line with alternated triangles and semicircles pointing in the direction that the front is moving. It ends at a low pressure area shown with a large L. So anytime you see a large L on the map, you know that's a low pressure system and begins at the other end when cold and warm fronts connect. Let's move on. What are isobars? So we already briefly talked about what isobars are, but here is like a, a proper definition of what, what they are. An isobar is a line, that should be a line on a weather map of constant barometric pressure drawn on a given reference surface. The isobaric pattern on a constant height surface is extremely useful in weather forecasting because of the close association between pressure and weather. So that is the definition of isobar. And you see in the last part here where they say the close association between pressure and weather, as we spoke about earlier on, high pressure brings good weather and low pressure brings bad weather. So just keep, keep that in mind, sorry. Moving on. So this is a synoptic chart you will see, and here is areas of high pressure and areas of low pressure. So here you can see this is a low pressure system right here, because one, the isobars are very close together, and also the barometric pressure falls below 10 15 millibar. So this is how we know that this is an area of low pressure. In the area of high pressure, which is right here and also here, here and here, well, not here, this is low pressure because this is 10 inch. This is 10 16, so this is high pressure. And also, you can note for this dotted line, this is a tropical wave. Always keep that in mind. Once you see a dotted line, tropical wave right here, tropical wave. So, high pressure, we see that the isobaric lines are far apart, and also the um, barometric pressure is above 1030 millibars. So we know this is a high pressure system. This one is 1028 millibars or 1028 hectopascals. So we know that it's a 
high pressure system moving on what is a high what is high and low pressure in an anticyclone high pressure the winds tend to be light and blow in a clockwise direction in the northern hemisphere also the air is descending which reduces the formation of cloud clouds and lead to light winds and settled weather conditions so high pressure settled weather conditions let's go on to low pressure in a depression a depression is called low pressure air is rising and blows in an anti-clockwise direction around the low in the northern hemisphere as it rises and cools water vapor condenses to form clouds and perhaps precipitation this is why the water in a depression is often the weather sorry in a depression is often unsettled they are usually weather fronts associated with depression so weather fronts associated with depression moving on what instruments are used to measure weather the first one we have is an anemometer and an anemometer is a weather instrument used to measure wind speed an anemometer and a wind vane are often combined into one instrument to gather information about moving air. The anemometer shown here is called a cup anemometer. As air moves and the cups turn, data is collected mechanically to produce a rating of wind speed and wind force. Next one, thermometer. A thermometer is an instrument used to measure the air temperature. Temperature can be measured in Celsius or Fahrenheit or also Kelvin. When the temperature increases, the mercury in the thermometer rises. When the temperature decreases, the mercury in the thermometer falls. So this here, the red spirit that you see, this is the mercury. Moving on. Wind vane. A wind vane is an instrument used to determine the direction from which air is moving. For example, a westerly wind is moving from west to east, not towards the west. Keep that in mind, that is usually tested on. Barometer. A barometer is an instrument used to measure air pressure. Meteorologists can determine whether the air pressure is rising or falling using a barometer. This data can then be used to predict specific weather conditions. High pressure is an indication of good weather, while low pressure indicates stormy weather. We spoke about that earlier on. Next instrument is a rain gauge. A rain gauge is used to measure the amount of falling precipitation. They can be mounted like the image on the top, or they can be anchored into the ground like the image on the bottom. Next one, a psychrometer. A psychrometer is used to measure relative humidity or amount of moisture in the air. It consists of two thermometers, one with a dry bulb and one with a wet bulb. Now this would be the dry bulb thermometer and this one would be the wet bulb thermometer because we can see that the wick is connected below. And normally there is like a glass below it with water, but some of them can be clear. So yeah. The instrument is still twirled around to measure the cooling effect of evaporation. A wind vane is used to measure wind direction. It spins on a rod and points in the direction from which the wind comes. So that's a wind vane. And then we also have a windsock. It, and a windsock is used at airports. If you live in Dominica like I do, at the Kenfield Airport, there is a windsock and normally it shows the direction of the wind, where the wind is um, blowing from. So this is what it shows and it gives, it's, I think that it is more visually appealing, it gives more visual information. And it indicates wind direction for takeoffs and landing. They help the pilot select the proper one runway so that they can take off and land into the wind. Now we also need to find out why synoptic charts are important. But obviously you cannot be just studying something for good looks. You need to know why synoptic charts are important. And I have highlighted that for you. Synoptic charts provide information on the distribution, movement, and patterns of air pressure, rainfall, wind, and temperature. This information is conveyed using symbols which are explained in a legend. We spoke about that before. Synoptic charts are used to report on the current weather and to predict future weather patterns. 
So the first thing when you when you're planning an event, you normally look at the weather. And how you are able to do that is because they are already generated in you know, chats for upcoming days. So you're able to just pull out your phone, watch the weather for this and that day, and you know whether or not you should plan it or whether or not you should shift the date for the event. So this is why synoptic charts are very important. Let's move on. Identifying systems on a synoptic chart. As you know, there are different systems that are placed on a synoptic chart. Well, this is why synoptic charts are created anyway, so that you can see which system is an effect, affecting an area, sorry, whether it be frontal systems, whether it be tropical storms, whether it be tropical waves, hurricanes, whatever it may be, the synoptic chart will tell you that. And now that you know what the symbols mean on the synoptic chart, I'm sure whenever they are um, having weather, um, whenever the weather channel is on, you yourself will be able to do your own interpretation of the synoptic chart along with the weatherman. <laughs> so let's move on. Um, First thing we have is frontal systems. As you know, we have different types of fronts. We have cold fronts, we have warm fronts, we have stationary fronts, and we also have occluded fronts. And this is how it looks on the synoptic chart or the weather map. So as you can see, here is your cold front, here is your cold front, and here is also a warm front. We know what these lines mean. We know this is a tropical wave in this area, so we know that. And this cold front is moving in an easterly direction, as you can see, as the arrows point out to us. And it is also located in the area of low pressure. So you should know what type of weather is affecting this area. Once you see the low pressure, you should know. So once they ask you what weather is affecting this area, where is this um, system traveling to? What is the name of the system? You can tell them carefully and in. You can tell them in preciseness, basically. Let's move on. Tropical wave. We know what the tropical wave looks like. We know that beforehand. This is what your tropical wave looks like. The dashes, I would say, looks like dashes. And it's normally located in area of low pressure because once the air pressure begins decreasing, the system will begin to... Um, to um, intensify so it will oh, not only be a tropical wave anymore but it can develop into a tropical storm and it can also develop into a hurricane once the pressure starts decreasing even more let's move on tropical storm this is how a tropical storm would look like on your weather map and as you can see it is located in an area of relatively low atmospheric pressure and this um tropical storm looks like it's moving in a westerly direction and if we were to interpret one of the weather stations more weather station models that are located in the area we can see that this is an overcast the area is very overcast so that's the cloud cover and also the winds are blowing in an easterly direction at 20 knots so we see our full stops we know that it's 20 knots so why is this overcast? Because we know low pressure brings bad weather. Basically, there will be precipitation. And once there is precipitation, you will expect overcast skies. Next one, hurricane. In the Caribbean, we know hurricanes are very dangerous because as Caribbean islands, we have been affected by many hurricanes before. My island in particular has been, have been affected by hurricane in 20 was it 2017 we were affected by hurricane maria which completely devastated our island it was a category 5 hurricane and trust me no one wants to experience hurricane again so typically hurricanes would be areas of really low pressure and the um wind speed would be around 75 miles per hour plus so this one doesn't really give like a clear to say a clear um picture of what a hurricane will look like but at least we can know that it is an area of very low barometric pressure right okay so let's move on so here i just have um the tropical definitions and the first one i have on the list 
is tropical depression. And a tropical depression is a tropical cyclone with maximum sustained to face winds of 38 miles per hour, 54 knots or less. Then we have our tropical storm that is maximum sustained to face winds of 39 to 74 miles per hour. And as we know, the terrible, the terrible hurricane, my apologies, has maximum sustained surface winds of 74 miles per plus miles per hour. So once it has passed the scale of 74 miles per hour or 64 plus knots, we know that it's a hurricane system developing. So I have tried my best to explain and expound on everything that you need to know as a student, whether you're doing the Cape Geography Unit 2 examination or whatever examinations or whatever tests you're doing, and you need to understand what synoptic charts are, or you need to interpret synoptic charts, um, learn the symbols, learn the weather systems that are associated with it, and also learn the importance of synoptic charts. Well, you have come to the right videos. videos. So um, honestly, I would like to thank you for watching. This is my first ever video on YouTube. And my YouTube channel name is S Academics. And the motto here is providing students with educational, interactive, and entertaining videos. So I would like to thank you for watching. And don't forget to like, subscribe, comment below, and also share this video with your friends so that they too can benefit from everything that is being said in this video. So thank you, and I will see you next time.